overall, I really do enjoy going and watching old wrestling shows from years and decades gone by. Especially because it reminds me of days gone by. It reminds me of my youth and my teenage years, my early adult years, and, you know, hanging out with friends and watching wrestling. All those emotions kind of overcome me as I watch some of these old shows and those memories come flooding back. So it could be a nice trip down nostalgia lane. But again, it's a, it's a mixed bag because that nostalgia is nice, but it also sucks. You should go back and watch and see what wrestling used to be and how cool wrestling used to be and how much of a big deal it was in the mainstream at this time. And yeah, that can be a bit depressing. It can make me very, very sad. Just like it make me sad if you watch this video, this retro review, and you don't go and follow the show on Twitter at OTR Essential is the Twitter handle, or smash that subscribe button, subscribe or die, and then click the bell, what the hell, set it up so that way you get notified of future videos from this channel. But it felt like, back to the review, felt like it was a good time to go back in time to what is often viewed as a memorable, significant, historical day in the landscape of professional wrestling, and that is January 4th, 1999. And that day throughout the past couple of decades has been held up as a shining example of WWE supremacy and superiority, a day that WWE emerged from, WCW dropped the ball, and the WWE, WWF at the time, never looked back. And I will say this, like it sounds great. The packaging has been well-crafted over the past 21 years. And the consistency with which some of the propaganda, as I will call it, the pro-WWE propaganda and spin at that, has been delivered, has been expert. It absolutely has been expertly done. Uh, and <laughs> the WWE has done a kick-ass job of crafting and honing the message. But the reality is a little bit different. The reality is, is that even at this time in 1999, you know, while WWF did a better rating for the show, if I recall correctly, this did around somewhere like a 5.7 or a 5.8. And WCW, it was around Nitro, was last two hours, it was like a 5.0. Um, but, you know, you always hear the thing about, the interesting dynamic at play here was that Raw was taped and Nitro was live and Eric Bischoff's on Nitro saying, hey, don't go anywhere. Uh, we've got everything you need to know about the other show later tonight. Mick Foley's going to win their world title. And then you get the comment, well, that'll put some butts in the seats. And then you always hear about the, hey, as soon as they said that, 800,000 people flipped over to uh, watch Raw. And that's just not really backed up by the evidence. It sounds great. It seems great. Well, when you look at those quarter hour ratings, I don't know that that necessarily truly backs that up. Again, sounds great. And the WWE has been so consistent in the delivering of that messaging. Like, you could run a political campaign off of the strength of that type of messaging. Well, <laughs> or you spend $100 million on two Senate campaigns and you lose. But it's interesting because this was the night, of course, that you had the infamous finger poke of doom on WCW's Nitro, where uh, <laughs> Hogan and Nash did some straight-up brother bullshit. And they always point to that as one of the leading examples of what led to the death of WCW. And again, especially the numbers the next few months in 99, just really don't back that up. They don't. So I wish we could look back at this moment or this date in wrestling history and view it less from a WWE ball washing standpoint and more of a, these were, this was a time where you had two wrestling shows doing monster numbers, drawing monster ratings, monster viewership for wrestling. And there are two shows that will live in time in wrestling history in perpetuity forever. There should be more focus to talk about that. And less about like who won that day and how that put the WWF ahead for good. And it's just all bullshit. We should be better than that. But I will tell you, like going back and watching this show, you feel like you're transported to another time. 
And for those of you that are watching me that are much younger, that either weren't even born by January 4th, 1999, or you were so young that you weren't watching wrestling or can't remember watching wrestling, or you weren't watching wrestling at the time, I, I cannot tell you how different everything about a show like this feels. Like from the very beginning, the corporation and DX promo segment kicks it off. And this was the setting of the theme throughout the night. It kind of all revolved around Vince McMahon, ultimately. But this was a show that ultimately revolved around heat and conflict between HBK, the commissioner, and Vince McMahon. This dealt with Vince McMahon and his spot in the Royal Rumble later that month, where before he had drawn number 30, and Shawn Michaels ultimately reminds him as the commissioner that he has final say-so. And once Vince McMahon decided to get in the Rumble, he becomes a wrestler, so now he, he reports to him. So he named him number two. Like, then you have the mankind element, mankind and what's happened with him. You have The Rock coming into his own, like so many things here. The only thing that was irritating about this opening promo segment, it was very, very well done, is those stupid fucking laser pens. I cannot tell you how irritating and aggravating those things used to be. Even at the time, I never got the trend. I never got into it. I never understood what the appeal was. I thought it was freaking stupid. And so many of you guys that might go back and watch some of these shows from the 98, 99, 2000 era, you, you're wondering to yourself, what the hell, did everybody have sniper rifles? I'm sure you know what it was, but it, it, goes, it gets so grating and annoying having to go back and watch it. It was like the laser pen version of the what chant. It was the what chant before the what chant became the what chant. And I hated every freaking minute of it. But when you look at how this show played out, you know, it was all centered. It all had a couple of common core themes and it was heavily featured throughout the night. They split it up and mixed it up and did an incredible job of it. But you look at this show at this time, early 1999, you can't believe that a lot of the same people that were overseeing this at that time, specifically Vince, would be the same people putting out the type of crap that they put out for Legends Night for the first Raw of 2021. And you come out of that opening segment and you go right to something different. It's a match between Ken Shamrock and Steve Blackman, a matchup of two legitimate badasses. You've got Dan the Beast Severin at ringside with his neck brace. This goes back at a time where WWF was big shit, and the UFC, for the most part, was largely insignificant. It absolutely was, but you were still, in this case, you're dealing with legit characters. You had somebody from the corporation, somebody not from the corporation. You know, you get the perfectly executed run-in by Billy Gunn, oh, well done match. It gives you something different from what you got in that opening segment. Man, seeing that George Carlin 10 10 to 20 ad, that was a throwback if there ever freaking has been one. And then when you come back from that commercial, it's awesome that Shamrock and Billy Gunn are fighting. Like usually now you would get no follow-up or you would get some really lame-ass interview with very poorly worded questions with a crappily written and crappily delivered and executed promo. And so you come right back and it's Shamrock and Gun brawling. It was, it was great. Like, you don't, just don't see that shit anymore. Then you come back and you've got Mankind comes in the ring and he's talking about he wants a shot at The Rock and the WWF Championship at the Royal Rumble. And this is where the other primary theme of the night comes into play. It's about mankind and his desire to get to the Royal Rumble and face off against The Rock for the title. And Vince McMahon sits there and tells him, you know, that's not going to happen. But if you want a shot at the title, you're going to have to fight Triple H tonight. And mankind was kind of adopted quasi by DX at the time. I like usually do all this shit like they could they could pivot and turn with characters and stories really, really quickly in a way you would never, ever see them be able to do now. And Mankind has got to face Triple H. And if he faces Triple H and beats him, then he wins a spot in the Royal Rumble. That's all Vince is going to give him. And it became a theme of how things played out throughout the course of the rest of the night. Then, in the meantime, he had some kind of filler here. But even with the filler stuff, you go back and watch. It's sexual chocolate Mark Henry versus Gold Dust. Like, even if there wasn't a ton of story between the two guys, at least you had two characters. You don't get either of that now. You would at least, everybody had a purpose or everybody had a story on TV. Everybody had something. 
And sexual chocolate's big thing was his lust for China. Yeah, we're going way, way back here for sexual chocolate. It's sexual, baby. Mm -mm. I'm going to give it all to you. <laughs> and China with the trans looking lady <laughs> and talking about how she basically was setting up for a threesome in Mark Henry face. <laughs> Now that was good attitude era sensationalism stuff. Just like Godfather versus Test. You know, the Godfather was the Godfather. The Godfather was so freaking cool. And Test was part of the corporation at this time. And, you know, Test looked, looked the part like he was going to be a future big time player here. Um, and again, this match had the Godfather. You got to see the hose. Like, it's all good. But then you get to the kind of one hour main event, the mid, mid show main event. And it's Mankind versus Triple H. Shane McMahon's made the special guest referee earlier in that promo segment by Vince McMahon. Again, everything tying back to Vince. That's why Vince was so instrumental during the Attitude Era. And I argue the most inter instrumental character out of anybody, the biggest star out of anybody, because everything had to funnel through him. Everything came through him. Everything that went through him became better because it was associated with him. Like, you'll notice one big name from this time that I have not mentioned at all is Stone Cold Steve Austin. We'll get to him, but the only real reference you had was at the very opening promo when Shawn Michaels talks about that he has a Stone Cold surprise for the corporation tonight. And then you have the commentators, Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler, talking about the Stone Cold surprise throughout the course of the night. That's what you got. But the whole thing was Shane McMahon's going to call the match straight down the middle until he gave Triple H the quick count for the victory, and now he's screwed mankind. And in it, su such a fitting thing for a Triple H and what God would become down the road. Like he was just a baby God at this point in time. is saying, you know, business is business, and a shot at the rumble is a shot in the rumble, and I've got to take it. But then he crotch shots <laughs> Shane McMahon and tells mankind he's all yours. And then he puts Shane McMahon in a submission move, which leads Vince to coming out. And Mankind now makes the, de makes the declaration that he's not going to let go of Shane McMahon until he gets what he wants. And he doesn't want The Rock now at the Royal Rumble. He wants The Rock tonight in the main event. If he did this kind of crap in today's wrestling, companies would get crucified for it. What do you mean you're going to take a guy from wrestling for a spot in the Rumble and then he loses and then immediately he's making a declaration now he wants the championship match and you're going to give it to him in the main event? But back then it worked. It absolutely worked. Like you could sense the urgency, you could sense the fire, you could sense the passion from all these guys, from the fans. Just like the whole aura and vibe around this was so spectacular. So spectacular going back and watching it. Um, this is incredible. Like... You wouldn't even recognize it if you're not familiar with that product. You can grow up in that time. Like, and for some of you, it might not resonate because you're not, you're not e equipped to understand it. You're not educated enough in what it used to be like and how consistently good it used to be. Even when it was bad, it's light years better than what you get now. Um, even some of the really bad, disastrous, spec unspectacular stuff. Like, you got D'Lo Brown versus Edge. Um, this was the whole crap with the stupid Terry Runnels pregnancy bullshit. Like she slips and she falls and then it's the ah, ha, 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 ha. and D Lo Brown sitting there all worried in the match stops. So like this was that this is what you could tell was that sensationalistic Springer like Russo shit. Russo did some good things. And when people try to dismiss him and say that everything that happened good during this time was Vince, that's bull. And we need to stop saying that. Vince was a lead writer. Russo was a lead writer. So he's heavily involved in the shows. He wrote them with Vince. You're going to tell me that Vince and a lot of the stuff that happened here, this was all McMahon and none of it was Russo? That's bullshit, and that's patently, blatantly unfair to him. But at the same token, you also got some of the really bad Russo that would squeeze in there, and this certainly was one of them. You follow this up with Kane taking on both of the Stooges because Vince McMahon was pissed that the Stooges allowed Shane McMahon to get in harm's way in any way. And he said, if anybody lets my son get in harm's way, you know, there is going to be consequences. So Kane beats the hell out of both of the Stooges. Again, you had these one or two core themes that all revolved around Vince ultimately, but they worked. But they played out throughout the course of the night. Like, look, listen to all the segments I got. The opening segment is Corporation and DX. 
Then about 20 minutes later, you got Mankind and Vince McMahon in a promo. Then the one hour main event is Mankind Triple H, spot in the rumble on the line with Shane McMahon as the guest referee, which then leads to Vince coming out and Mankind making the statement that he won't let go until he gets his match tonight. Like Kane versus the Stooges, like so much of this was built around that one character and that one or two major storyline pieces, just so incredibly well done that we would never, ever get in today's wrestling business. In fact, this show was done so well that the thing that was hyped up the most throughout the night was the hardcore championship match between Road Dogg and Al Snow. Like, this match got quite a bit of buildup. This match got quite a bit of lead up into it in terms of it being mentioned and referenced and you get graphics talking about it. And this hardcore match was a lot of fun. It ended up eventually getting to the point where these two guys were fighting outside of the arena in the snow. I thought it was pretty cool. Oh, why can't we get my son like this anymore? But of course, the thing that everybody remembers the most from this show is that WWF Championship match with Mankind taking on The Rock. And you really don't remember much about the match. And the match was kind of the match. You had the corporation was out there. You had DX was out there, you know, and then after a little while, it became a bit of a schmaz. And then you get to the big boiling point, which is Austin's music hits. And here comes Austin. He's a cussing. He's a fussing. And he's walking down the ramp. And Vince and Shane are like, no. And Vince is trying to get him to stop him. And Austin comes in, grabs a chair, and gives The Rock one of those good, clean headshots you could never fucking get away with in today's wrestling world. But back in 99, oh, it's a concussion, bitches. And he throws and pulls Mankind over The Rock. And it's one, two, three. And Mrs. Foley's baby boy has achieved the dream of a lifetime. He is the new WWF champion. And the crowd was super hot for this, obviously. Like, this is a phenomenal moment. You know, and the commentators, I think, and especially Michael Cole, I think it's one of the highlights of his career, personally. For all the people that said he couldn't do it, you know, like, the way they ha hyped this up, that this was a legitimate surprise, it was a legitimate upset, helps The Rock, and you still, you only had The Rock lose because he got whacked in the head by the top guy in the company at the time, who didn't have the championship, and Stone Cold Steve Austin, like, that doesn't hurt your champion. And you're emphasizing with Mankind, with Mick Foley, that this is a lifelong dream and this is something you never thought possible and that dreams come true. Like, there's so much about it that you get emotionally invested in everything. And the way they used to layer multiple angles into one larger story and you could play different characters off and the way they used to be able to feed in and off of each other was just fantastic. Like, you could sit there and do this with Austin and be talking about Austin and McMahon and the build up to the Royal Rumble and them being the first two entrants. Now you're also talking about Mankind's the new World Wrestling Federation heavyweight champion. You know, The Rock is now the corporate champion without a title and you could go off and do some business with them as you're buying your time to get Austin to rock at WrestleMania 15. Like, golly. Just like any wrestling show, you're going to have your sporadic shit. And this show certainly has it. Like, not everything about the Attitude Era and the Monday Night Wars period was glorious. And don't ever let anybody tell you otherwise. There was plenty of garbage and there was plenty of crap. But, the stories were way more engaging, way more interesting, were better told. You had more interesting, compelling characters and personalities and talkers to be able to execute and deliver on the key pieces and narratives of those stories. The fans were more engaged. Like, you could take the product seriously. You felt like you had something for everyone. Like, I almost caution people to not go back and watch too many of these old Raws, too many of these old Smackdowns, too many of these old Nitros, because... You get too caught up in just how good shit used to be and how bad it is now. We went from stories, characters, personalities, drama, suspense, cliffhangers, big payoffs, to flippy, fucky, nobody gets heat, nobody gets over, nobody gets really emotionally invested in any of these guys type of wrestling.
It's really, really depressing, frankly. But yeah, this is a, it was a fantastic show. It really was. And the way that they were able to really build everything off of Vince and then mankind and everything throughout the whole course of the night was all about that. Whereas now you would have it and you'd be so pounded down your throat that you hate these theme type of shows. Back in 1999, the characters were so great and the stories were so interesting and they knew how to work these things that it was fantastic must-see television. So yes, if you've never watched the January 4th, 1999 episode of Raw and you have the WWE Network, go watch this show. Absolutely go watch this show. So let me know what you thought about this review of the January 4th, 1999 episode of Raw. Let me know what other retro reviews you want me to do in the future. I'll probably be back on here next week doing another one. Again, make sure you follow the show on Twitter and subscribe to this damn channel if you haven't already, especially if you enjoy these retro reviews or any of the other videos that you've maybe creeped on and, and watched me do. All right? Thanks, guys. I'm out.